Hello friends, today 12th of January, we all celebrate Swami Vivekananda Ji's birthday and in this auspicious day, we are going to discuss a very important topic that is about history of clinical trials and we need to acknowledge today is a very special day at the same time, this great man, this great sage, once upon a time had told this beautiful quote, this beautiful uh, sentences, that the history of the world shows that those who never thought of their little individuality were the greatest benefactors of the human race. And the more men and women think of themselves are less, they are the less able to do for others. So in history, from history, we learn about how to react in future. And that is why when we talk about history of clinical trials, those lessons will guide us in our future planning. So maybe for next 20 minutes, we'll try to cover this broad area when talking about this history of clinical trials. First of all, as we are talking about history, we need to understand, we need to acknowledge International Clinical Trials Day, the story of Dr. James Lind, then we will talk few incidences from pre-James Lind era and then what happened post-James Lind era. Of course, as we are talking about clinical trial, ethics is something which is very important. So we will try to discuss a little bit about the evolution of ethical framework. At the same time, we will also try to cover the Indian context and especially as today's Swami Vivekananda Ji's Jab Janmadin birthday, we will try to understand from his lessons, from his teaching, how those teachings are important while conducting clinical trial too. In every aspect of life, we got inspiration from Swami Vivekananda. So today also we will discuss about how the Swami Vivekananda's lesson teaching is going to influence our clinical trial journey. So when we talk about International Clinical Trials Day, we need to remember the date that is 20th May. So every year, 20th May, we celebrate International Clinical Trial Day. And the story starts with uh, Dr. James Lind, when he had conducted an experiment in the sheep known as HMS Salisbury. That was the time when more French and Englishmen were dying due to scurvy. More, more, the number were more compared to the killing by the wire, that war number. So they were dying due to scurvy more than the war. So what he had done, he had divided 12 sick sailors who were supposed to be suffering from scurvy into six pairs and provided six different interventions one of the group who had received these two oranges and one lemon, they got recovery. And ultimately, in 1795, almost 50 years after, British made citrus compulsory in the diet of the sailors. So this experiment was very much landmark in nature because that had guided the British people to change, to do something uh, 
for their sailors to prevent death due to scurvy. So this is the famous book and we all should remember Treatise of the Scurvy, which is the origin of this concept of international clinical trial day. So what were the lessons from this Lynch treatise of the scurvy? First of all, those subjects, 12 subjects, which were divided into six groups. So all of them were in some similar condition. So the like was compared with like that control the variables. And we all know the importance of baseline matching now. And when we talk about another important part, every clinical trial, every clinical research may be associated with some confusion. And that will help us to do another research, another experiment. And here also, the timeline, almost 50 years, because they were confused. After this Lynch experiment in 1745 or like that, 50s, uh, it took 50 years, almost 1795, to, to think about, to make the rule of using uh, fruits in the, for the sailors to prevent scurvy. Why this is happening? Because when they were uh, making this experiment, there was a thing, thinking like that, the fruits are expensive, the perishability is a, was a concern. So they, they had developed a complicated method to prepare an inspisited juice. So when we, we are making inspisited juice, so that will become devoid of vitamin C. So without vitamin C, it will not work. So there will there, there is an association with confusion. But after all, experiments they found, yes, so this is due to the results are not coming because that, that is not containing the vitamin C. So they had prepared the fresh juice, fresh fruit. They used that and that, make, that made the uh, thing happen. And ultimately in 1795, uh, 97, like that, the British make the regulation that all sellers should get these uh, fruits. So this is an important part for any clinical research, any clinical trial. There should be something confusion. And we need to take care of those confusion. Uh, we need to overcome that in future research. Another important aspect in this book, Laughlin Treatise, uh, he had discussed about some earlier events when Vasco de Gama, Ricard Hawkins, they were also using orange and lemons. So previous documentations are there. Just like if we think about today's uh, uh, thesis life, we, we, we had spent a lot of time during our review of literature. So to study similar type of researches, similar type of clinical experiments, is th these are crucial. So previous documentation history is important. And another important uh, aspect of this particular experiment, uh, when they use some technology to distill the fresh wa water from seawater, uh, that also emphasize on occupational health. So this is one type of secondary outcomes of this particular uh, experiment that had been carried out by Dr. Lind. So secondary outcomes are important for us also now when we are conducting clinical trial conducting clinical research we need to check our secondary outcomes and depending on the secondary outcomes we need to prepare our future research plan so just coming back from lynn's experiment and this is one landmark trial 
we all know empiric outcome. And if we see the result of empiric outcome, uh, in the in the published NEGM article, all of us will get this uh, result uh, in the results section and all may be astonished, all may be very happy and will tell, yes, so uh, primary outcome, uh, if we just check, the hazard ratio was 0 0.86. So there is a straightaway relative risk reduction of 14% in patients with event. And when we call uh, death from cardiovascular cause, so there is a straightaway 0.38% uh, relative risk reduction in terms of uh, death from cardiovascular cause. For hospitalization for heart failure, there is 35% relative risk reduction. So we may utter this type of uh, fascinating sentences, but the very important thing, what we had learned from James Lind experiment is, it is not only about the result, we should jump and check and uh, decide about the outcome and decide about the research. We need to check for the baseline characteristics, whether they are matching or not. So this is very important. Maybe you will not find in the NEGM uh, main, main, main article, you will get it from some appendix. Uh, so you need to find out that before uh, commenting, finally, you have to check whether the baseline characteristics in two groups matching or not. So here we want, generally what we want, the p-value should be uh, less than uh, 0 0.05, but here it should be, uh, p-value should be more than that, and there should not be any statistically significant differences. And that is the concept came from the Linz experiment too, where he had uh, equally distributed uh, the groups and uh, controlled the variables very well. Another important issue, when we talk about this empiric, same you can see the empiric outcome investigators in the similar uh, journal, same journal, another original article had been published. So here, we can see the secondary outcome. So in this particular article, they had mentioned about the secondary outcome results. So when we are talking about secondary outcome results, again, they were trying to find out how much empagliflogen is beneficial in terms of preventing uh, the incidence or worsening of nephropathy and they, are, they had also prepared one renal composite outcome. So in this both picture of what we can understand, there is straight away around 40% relative risk reduction in terms of uh, cumulative probability of events in terms of uh, nephropathy or worsening nephropathy and even the post hoc renal composite outcome there, all, there is also a straightaway relative risk reduction of uh, almost 46% relative risk reduction. So that is, and, and, and they, they are statistically significant. But again, what is post hoc analysis? Again, if we go back to the Lynch's treatise of, uh, that is the, his experiments and that book, there also we, we found out there are some importance of secondary outcome. But secondary outcome is not all about uh, you. They, they, they are not the basic thing. They are giving us some idea. And on that idea, we, we, we may need to do some more research. So just think about this MCQ. And I'm, I'm requesting you all to just put your answer in the chat box so that we can involve your brain also. So what is the importance of post hoc analysis when we are talking about post hoc analysis in scientific research? 
what caution should be exercised in its interpretation? Option A, post hoc analysis is primarily used for confirming hypothesis established by experiments and its results are always definitive. So if you are think, thinking that this is true, you can write A is true. Or if, it, if you are feeling it is false, then A is false. B is post hoc analysis is crucial for generating hypothesis from existing data. But its conclusion should be viewed with skepticism. Skepticism until confirmed by further prospective studies. So this should be viewed with skepticism until confirmed by further uh, studies. If you are thinking this is true, you can write B is true. Post hoc analysis is irrelevant in uh, scientific research as it does not involve any experimental methods. Uh, post hoc analysis is the only method for determining structural aspects in molecular biology such as DNA structure and its results are always accurate. So I think uh, many of you are giving the right answer and that is when we talk about post hoc analysis, they are hypothesis generating. They are already the data is existing and we should uh, make some uh, interference from the existing data. But as it is not pre-designed, this is secondary outcome data. So the conclusion should be viewed with skepticism until again confirmed by further prospective studies. So what we found in Empiric trial, we found some hypothesis that empagliflozin is better, maybe better in preventing the or preventing or worsening, uh, decreasing the worst worsening episodes of nephropathy or the renal outcome, in terms of renal outcome, amphagliflozin may be better. But when we talk about another study, prospective study, so this was from that particular hypothesis, the investigators had developed this plan. And this is a separate study, EMPA kidney collaborative group. So that was EMPA reg, now it is EMPA kidney. So now this study, they, they, they had found out how much uh, reduction, relative risk reduction is almost 28%, uh, which was statistically significant with empagliflozin and almost 2.5 years follow-up. So now we can talk, this is a study which is uh, showing empagliflozin can prevent uh, re reduce the progression of kidney disease or death from cardiovascular disease. There are other studies. So now we can conclude like that, that empagliflozin can be used in uh, CKD. And I think now after this empiric outcome uh, published, uh, regulators had also changing the level and empagliflozin is now also uh, added in the armamentarium to treat diabetic kidney disease. And even in non-diabetic kidney disease also, they, they have some role. So the journey starts with empiric outcome where it was a secondary outcome. And uh, there were proposed talk analysis. There were some uh, uh, sign that yes, empagliflozin can be beneficial, but they need to do a full-blown study, a properly designed study. And that was done in EMPA kidney outcome trial. And ultimately EMPA had shown its beneficial role in preventing uh, renal disease progression. So this is the thing we need to understand. This is the importance of secondary outcome. Secondary outcome, uh, can give us the momentum to do a new research and that if we that post hoc analysis only can give us some signal that it could be better 
But to prove it, it is better. We need to do a new research. Now coming to pre-James Lynch era, uh, when we talk about 562 BC, this book is famous, especially when we are talking about uh, history of inter inter uh, clinical trials, the book of Daniel, which was written by, that there was a story which was uh, about King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. So he had ordered his people to eat only meat and drink, only wine. So this diet, he believed, would keep them in sound physical condition. Now, many young men of royal blood who prefer to eat vegetables objected. Now, King allowed these rebels to follow a diet of legumes and water for 10 days. Now, what happened? Vegetarians appeared better nourished than the meat eaters. And King finally permitted the legume lovers to continue their diet. So this is what type of experiment? This is one type of open, uncontrolled human experiment. But why it is important? Because this experiment had guided a decision about public health. So I'm just taking because uh, some time, because this open study, this concept need to be very much clear. This is an example when researchers assess the effectiveness of prajosin combined with scorpion antivenom in assisting recovery from scorpion sting. So this is also an open level randomized control trial. The control treatment only prajosin, another arm prajosin plus scorpion antivenom. So this was done in one hospital, assuming in, a, in India. So participants were patients with grade 2 scorpion envenomation, older than 6 months, with no cardiorespiratory or central nervous system abnormalities. So in total, 70 patients were recruited, allocated to treatment, 35 to prajosin plus scorpion antivenom, uh, another 35 to prajosin alone by block randomization. So, few important MCQs. Let's let's uh, think about which of the following statements, if any, are true. After randomization, patients were aware which treatment they had been allocated to. So, this is an just think about this. This is an open level study. The trial was liable to allocation bias. The trial design minimized assortment bias. And allocation concealment was not possible in the above trial. Before answering the question, let's go through some important facts. First of all, the blinding. When we talk about blinding, it is very important to, to, while we are doing some phase three clinical trial. Minimize assessment bias. When we are talking about single blinding, that involves masking the subject only. When double blinding, so I am masking subject and investigator. And triple binding extends to also data analyst. So data analyst, subject, and investigator. And sometimes when we do unblinding, that challenges arises in trials with some specific limitations too. But in nutshell, this is the concept behind blinding. Now, when we talk about trial recruitment and allocation, after recruiting participants, they were allocated to treatments using block randomization in this prajosin trial. So block randomization was used. So treatment groups, it could be prajosin combined with scorpion antivenom, or it could be prajosin alone. 
So there could be equal probability of allocation. Each participant, they had an equal chance of being allocated to either treatment. And that ensured the fairness. And we, what we talk about justice. Due to randomization process, there was no allocation bias in this trial. So when we, we do randomization, that limits the allocation bias. And there, in this particular trial, we had used randomization. The block randomization was used. So that reduced the allocation bias. There is no allocation bias. And when we talk about lack of blinding in this particular trial, because this is an open trial, open study. So participants and researchers were aware of treatment allocations. So as there is this awareness, this type of setup made the trial susceptible to ascertainment bias, or we can simply call it as detection bias. So when there is a knowledge of treatment allocation, that can influence, <laughs> sorry, the assessment of outcome, either by the investigators or trial participants. So there is a possibility of ascertainment bias, which leads to some distorted or exaggerated perception of the differences, uh, specifically in the effectiveness between treatments. And due to lack of blinding researchers knowledge of which, uh, which receive, that means which treatment I am receiving, whether I am taking prajosin combined with scorpion antivenom or prajosin alone, that might have influenced their evaluation of treatment effectiveness. So a certain bias possibility is there when there is, uh, or we can call it as detection bias, when we are not doing blinding. But this is a very important concept, allocation concealment versus blinding. So when we talk about allocation concealment, so generally we are keeping the allocation sequence, that means the order of treatment allocation post-recruitment that is hidden from the patients and who are recruiting the participants. So that is allocation concealment. So the keep allocation sequence, that is hidden from the patients and recruiter. That is very important. But blinding means not disclosing the treatment allocation to the participants, investigators, and peripheral staffs after random allocation. So that is blinding. So allocation concealment can be done even when we are not doing blinding. So allocation concealment always possible. And that is very important because if we do allocation concealment, it will reduce the selection bias. Yes, it is essential for effective blinding because if we not do allocation concealment but do blinding, selection bias will be there. So that is why it is very important to do allocation concealment first, then that will help us in future blinding process and prevention of selection bias. Blinding sometimes not achievable like this case, like cases what we had discussed, uh, some lifestyle intervention trials, lifestyle intervention studies. So blinding is not achievable there, but we can do allocation concealment there. So potential for selection bias without concealment because if as a recruiter, I know the allocation sequence that might selectively recruit patients based on the expected treatment response. So open level trials do not necessarily involve this randomization or a controlled treatment. But again, we can do allocation concealment. So now if we just think about the MCQ, what we had asked, which is true. After randomization, participants were aware which treatment they had been allocated to. 
The trial was liable to allocation bias, this tragocene trial. The trial design minimized the assortment bias and allocation concealment was not possible in the above trial. So the answer is only the A, that is after randomization, participants were aware which treatment they had been allocated to because here we are not doing blinding. But as we had done the allocation concealment, so it was not at all uh, a proper study where we can do that, but allocation concealment can be done. Another important issue I just want to mention here, the broad study, just like uh, uh, similar type of maybe plant-based diet, which is a very famous study, uh, a ran just check this title, a randomized control trial using a whole food plant-based diet in the community for obesity, ischemic heart disease or diabetes. Now in the blinding, they had done this uh, statistician blinded, but the participants and the uh, researcher, they were aware of the allocation, they were not blinded. Now the question is, so one, one is blinded, so can we write down here, single blind randomized control trial? No. So that is the thing we need to also remember. When we are talking about single blind, that means only the participants are blinded. When we are talking about double blind, then the participants and the uh, clinical researcher, the researcher is blinded. And when we are talking about triple blind, then we are talking about statistician. That should be also blinded. But only statistician was blinded. So we can say it is a single blind. That is not true. So coming from uh, the story of Nebuchand Nejar to Avicenna in 1025 AD, again, uh, he was very famous to write this book on a name as Canon of Medicine. Few important statement from this book, which is important for today's uh, clinical trial. A remedy should be used in its natural state in disease without complications. Study be made of the time of action and of the reproducibility of the effect. A treatment should be tested in a controlled environment to reduce confounding factors, in this case by excluding patients with complex comorbidities. And that is why generally in clinical trials, when we are talking about drug development, especially the phase two, phase three clinical trial, we try to minimize this complexity. And that is, that's increased the internal validity for any clinical trial. But when we are talking about uncontrolled environment, real world evidence studies, they had more external validity. They have less internal validity, but external validity will be more. So this concept was, uh, we can see, uh, long back during this Avicenna's textbook uh, that was written. Again, an accidental uh, trial, we can say, by Ambroise Paré in 1537, was responsible for the treatment of the battlefield wounded soldiers. This was one type of first clinical trial of a novel therapy, which was conducted accidentally. So conventional treatment oil was not adequate to treat all the wounded. So he had used some unconventional treatment, place a digestive made of yolks of eggs, oil of roses and turpentine. What he had found, unconventional treatment arm, they had slept well, they had little pain and wound was not inflamed or swollen. So that actually changed his practice. Now coming to post James Lynch era, a few important landmarks and 1800 was the uh, century of where we, we had seen the arrival of placebo. Yes, it's, it is something, it takes the place of actual substance and bogus, someone had written like this. But in 1863, United States physician Austin Flint had planned 
the first clinical study comparing a dummy remedy to an active treatment. This was given regularly and became well known in his words as the placebo uh, remedy for rheumatism. And in 1886, uh, Flynn described the study in his book, A Treatise on the Principles and Practice of Medicine. So the concept of placebo uh, was there. This is again very interesting. The patulin uh, uh, beneficial in the common cold. So some newspaper uh, report had come like new cure for colds coming soon. How that come? There was a paper in Lancet which had described about penicillium patulinum extraction on the chemical and biological properties. So there were a small line that had mentioned it is it may be beneficial in killing viruses like common cold virus. That small sentence had been picked up by uh, reporters and make it a headline. So the, the newspapers uh, making this type of statements more valuable than penicillin. Will it make our servicemen fight better? Because that was the time of uh, Second World War. So this type of thing had led to something called as fast double blind placebo control trial, patrolling for common cold. So few important strategies were uh, followed there. They had effectively uh, done this random concurrent allocation of patulin or control. We can see here how the random concurrent allocation was done. And ultimately, this particular trial had shown patulin does not produce any good effects. Another important uh, milestone is MRC streptomycin trial. Uh, to treat tuberculosis, which had been initiated in 1946. So we all know this great gentleman, Sir Bradford Hill. Uh, he was the father figure to, to develop this particular trial. So he was initially very much anxious that physicians should be unwilling to give up the doctrine of anecdotal experience. Uh, so he, he was very much... Uh, in uh, to develop some specific systemic enrollment criteria and data collection procedures. He had done again the allocation concealment, a technique used to prevent selection bias by concealing the allocation sequence from those assigning participants to the intervention groups until the moment of uh, assignment, prevents researchers from unconsciously or otherwise influencing which participants are assigning assigned to the intervention or control group. So these are important uh, landmarks that had been uh, done in this particular trial. So randomization for treatment balance. So this was the first time introduced by Sir Austin Bradford Hill. And we can see the picture of Sir Bradford Hill. Another important uh, factor in this particular trial was the objective measures like interpretation of X-rays, uh, which was done by some experts who were blinded to the patient's treatment assignments. There were some questions on ethics because we are using streptomycin in one arm, another arm we are not using streptomycin. So how much that is rational? How much that is ethical, where, where we already know that streptomycin has some beneficial role in tuberculosis and it, 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 it is used in US, in not, it is used in Europe. But uh, the argue was that as the amount of streptomycin available uh, in Europe uh, from US was not that much. Uh, so, uh, we, 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 we can do this trial and after having the trial report, we can finally decide to prepare streptomycin in adequate amount. So again, another important true or false, simple randomization lead to imbalances 
in treatment assignments. Is it true or false? Just write down in your chat box. Block randomization ensures equal allocation per arm. Variable block sizes prevent unblinding. Stratification promotes confounding with interventions. Randomization alone may achieve balance in large trials. Stratification enables meaningful subgroup analysis. So all are true except as we are talk talking about stratification, they enables meaningful subgroup analysis, but they are not promoting confounding with the interventions. So they are preventing the confounding factors within the interventions. So next part, when we talk about evolution of ethical framework, I think this picture is well known to all of us. And I think we had also discussed multiple times this topic while taking the GCP, Good Clinical Practice Workshop. So this first picture, which was um, uh, during the Nazi war crime, the they were, these prisoners were exposed to extremes of temperature until they die just to check their physiological uh, changes happen to these extremes of temperature, which was very cruel. Again, this is a very a nasty experiment conducted in US, that is the Tusky syphilis trial. When the syphilis patients, they were not giving uh, prisoners, they were not giving any treatment. They, they were just checked for the natural course of uh, syphilis. Next, this is again a very, very unfortunate story at Willowbrook School, where the mentally retarded uh, students were there. There, they, they were have been, they, they were being exposed to hepatitis A germs, and to check the natural history of hepatitis A without providing treatment, they were just being checked for the hepatitis A natural history, and this is another. Milgram study, which is also a very unfortunate in, uh, incident uh, that actually fake the test subject. Uh, the original subject, they were pretending to feel pain. The original subject, they were being exposed, they were uh, giving some shocks. So they were not properly informed and some cruelty had been tested. So that is something very, very uh, unethical, what we can say. And of course, this uh, this beautiful girl, uh, though there is an unfortunately, there is no limb is developed. And we know about this thalidomide disaster. And this Dr. McBride, uh, the Austrian physician who had first time recognized this complications with thalidomide, and uh, this lady, Dr. Kelsey, uh, who had prevented the entry of thalidomide, and uh, she was awarded by that time President uh, Kennedy, the highest civilian award. Uh, she was the drug regulator, and she 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 she, she had seen something uh, about thalidomide and had prevented its entry in US market. So with each uh, hammering in the knee, there is one knee-jerk re response. So I am hammering the knee, there is one knee-jerk response. So similarly, with this type of uh, unfortunate incidences that happened in the history, there are some evolution of ethical principles starting from Nuremberg Court in 1947 to uh, declaration of Helsinki in 19, uh, 1964, then Belmont report in 1979, then uh, Kefauver Harris Amendment done after the uh, Dr. Kelsey's achievement uh, preventing that after that thalidomide disaster. So Nuremberg Court, the main thing was that essentiality of the voluntariness of consent. That was the first time it came up. 
Then declaration of Helsinki in 1964, the general principles and specific guidelines on use of human subjects in medical research. Uh, Kefa Borhari's amendment strengthened the federal oversight of drug testing and included a requirement for informed consent. Belmont re report three important pillars. One is respect for persons, beneficiaries, and justice. So this uh, helped ultimately to have the GCP, which is good clinical practice. One is quality data, another is ethics. And when we talk about quality data, it is data of reported results are credible and accurate. When you talk about ethics, so rights, integrity, confidentiality of the trial subjects are protected. We know about the 1990s, which is the decade of harmonization. The first time the conference, that is International Conference on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use. That was uh, organized. The primary participants were US, European Union, Japan. There were regulatory and industry representatives. Canada, Australia, Nordic countries, had played their role as observers. WHO was facilitator, mainly ICH topics. We need to know about four broad headings, some quality topics, safety topics, efficacy topics, and multidisciplinary M topics. The GCP, good clinical practice, actually comes under the efficacy uh, subpart, efficacy topics, E6 of GCP. So now talk about India. And when we talk about India, we need to know about the regulations and guidelines in India, and we need to acknowledge the contribution of these two esteemed institutions, our regulatory bodies, CDSCO, Central Drug Standards Control Organizations, under the Director Control General of India. And also we have our guidelines uh, prepared by ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. So these key documents in clinical research, uh, when we are talking about Indian per perspective, we need to remember, which started with Drugs and Cosmetic Act in pre-independence era, 1940, 1945. Uh, we, we found, we got the Drugs and Cosmetic Rules. Then the Schedule Y Amendment, which is a very important, had, done in, uh, had been done in 2005. CDSCO came up with Indian Good Clinical Practice Guideline, guideline in 2001. ICMR first ethical guidelines developed to conduct clinical research in 2000, which had a revision on 2006. Then guidelines for stem cell research and therapy. First time ICMR uh, came up along with Department of Biotechnology in 2007, which had a revision in 2013. And we have Final, uh, the latest one is National Guidelines on Stem Cell Research in 2017. So this book is very important for all of us who are conducting any type of clinical research, especially observational studies. The students, the PG students who are conducting thesis, they need to obey this guideline. So public health research, social and behavioral sciences research for health, uh, there is one very important chapter. We can see it is 2017, but this chapter had actually helped us uh, in COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we should salute those people who had developed this guideline. There was a specific uh, chapters on research, how to conduct research during humanitarian emergencies and disasters, and which had actually fastened our vaccine development strategies, vaccine development studies. So a few other specialized areas like informed consent process, biological material storage, biobanking and data sets and vulnerability uh, have been expanded into separate sections. So this is a very key documents we need to go through it. And in 2011 to 2020, this trend is very important. Clinical trial in India. What happened in clinical trial scenario? If we start from 2011, it was only 5.5% of global share, which becomes in 2019, 11%. The rise is very high. In 2020, due to COVID, there, is, there was one drop, but again, it now becomes almost 12%. So 
India has accounted for an 8.3% share of the global clinical trials activity in 2020, which becomes 11%. And uh, if we compare it with last 10 year average, which was 6.2%, uh, now it is very, uh, very, very satisfactory. Why it is? I think one of the very important event that happened in India is in 2019, a new drug clinical trial rule. And we should go by this rule very well, thoroughly. And that would help us in uh, conducting clinical trial in a very efficient way. This is a very uh, interesting uh, image taken from Grimm's et al. So first of all, when we are doing any clinical study, we need to understand as an investigator, I am assigning exposures. Whether I am assigning exposures, that means I am uh, deciding upon which group will take the drug and which is not. So if I am assigning exposures, then that is experimental study. If it is not, if I am not ex assigning the exposures, I'm just observing, that is a simple observational study. So depending on that, when we are doing a clinical trial, experimental study, we should follow this new drug clinical trial rule 2019 thoroughly. And when we are doing observational study, again, we have this ICMR document, ICMR guideline. Yes, there are some overlap. Sometimes we, we, we need to refer to another document. But if we go by these two documents thoroughly, that could be immensely helpful for our conduct, conducting clinical trial or any clinical uh, studies. But as we are talking about India, it is important to acknowledge the philosophical contribution done by our Indian ancestors. And when Vidura had been asked by Yudhishthir in Mahabharata that how I can be a rational king, just a simple answer done by Vidura, Atmana Pratipulani Pareshuna Samacharit. It was the same thing which was written maybe after in Bible also. That is, do unto others what you would like others to do unto you. Similarly, as a clinical researcher, when I am talking about ethics in clinical research, just think your clinical research participant chair as your own chair and think that you think yourself in the position of your clinical research participant and just behave like or think like you were conducting the clinical research on yourself or your very close family members. And if you get an answer, yes, you can do it also in yourself or in your family member, then I think you will get the answer that yes, you are doing a ethical study. So this is very important and again when we are talking about our uh, uh, very concept of therapeutic equipoise or clinical equipoise so this equanimity concept is important as a clinical researcher and that is why uh, we often refer to this particular sloka from Bhagavad Gita Yogasta Kuru Karmani Sangam Toktva Dhananjaya Siddho Asiddho Samo Bhutva Samattam Yoga Uchyate. So this balance is important. This uh, equanimity is important. And when we are doing clinical trial, do not uh, think about the success or failure of a dog. You have to do your work properly. And I think as today we are talking about Swami Vivekananda, I think many of us know this is the logo, logo of Ramakrishna Mission. And when we talk about logo of Ramakrishna Mission, it was drawn by Swami Vivekananda for the first time. And the explanation is beautiful. We can see this wavy water. This is the wavy water. This is actually symbolic of karma. All we can see this lotus. That is a lotus of bhakti, devotion. Then the rising sun, 
that is symbolic of gyan, knowledge. And this encircling serpent, that is very important and that is indicative of yoga and awakened kundalini shakti, which was uh, later explained by Swami Vivekananda as attention, our attention level. And if we have all this coordinated, like where we water, lotus of bhakti, rising of gyan, and that uh, encircling serpent, or we can say uh, the attention, then we can see the swan in the picture. That stands for Paramatma, our ultimate uh, destination. So what is important, he had mentioned, Union of karma, jnana, bhakti, and yoga. If we do it perfectly, that means karma means our knowledge, uh, our work, and that should be a perfect work. That work should be in a state of equanimity. Gyan, that means the knowledge is important. Without knowledge, we cannot do anything. Then the lotus, the bhakti, the devotion. Devotion means devotion to ethics. So our work should be a moral one. So morality should be there with bhakti, proper bhakti towards my research participants. And attention, the encircling serpent, the yoga we are talking, that is the attention. So if we have a very good karma, very good work, proper work, documentation, then devotion to the research participants, that is the ethics, then gyan, the knowledge, baseline knowledge, you, you should have a knowledge to conduct any clinical research. And finally, the attention throughout to have a perfectly, you have to assure the quality of your work. Quality assurance should be there. Quality control, what we are talking about. If we do everything in a perfect way, then the research will actually reach to the ultimate position. That is, we can reach our ultimate destination, that is Paramatma. We can have the Paramatma, the Darshan. And that is the beauty of Swami Vivekananda. If we, if we dissect any of his teaching, we can... Uh, we can place them in our discussion like any way. So this lesson, with this lesson, I want to thank you all and again wish you all the uh, today's, as, as today is a birthday of Swami Vivekananda, we should uh, again uh, pranam him and uh, thank you for listening. If you have any question, if you have any comment on this topic, you can raise in the chat box. We can try to address those comment questions uh, in that time. Thank you. Thank you very much.